Welcome to our webinar. Um, thank you everybody for dialing in and for joining us today. A quick intro to the webinar and your hosts. Uh, today we will be talking about the fundamentals of script writing. So when you sit down at your computer, you're finally ready to write that script. Now what? And of course, we'll be looking at some of the features of Celtics that will allow you to format your script to be for, uh, aligned with industry standards, how to have a really smooth writing process, and then of course, key aspects of collaborating with others on your script. Now, a quick intro to me. Uh, my name is Anya. I manage the customer success team at Celtics. Um, a little bit about me. I live in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, and I've been at Celtics for just around nine months now. Um, I do a lot of creative writing in my spare time, not scripts, but we'll get there eventually. Um, but more importantly, introducing to you Andrew, Andrew Winter, who will be your host and guiding you through the process of script writing today. Andrew works on our product team with Celtics and in his spare time is a writer, director, producer, coffee enthusiast, and also has a very, very Canada appropriate last name. Uh, yeah, very, very appropriate. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Um, this is where I take the reins. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, small background on me, I uh, have a lot of experience in the industry, about seven or eight years on set, um, film school, and I have been working at Celtics for approximately almost eight years. It'll be eight years in upcoming in January. Um, and I'm pretty much the, well, I'm the product manager and also the one of the subject matter experts within our sort of film and TV um, system here at Celtics. Um, so what we're going to be covering today. Huh. Um, so quick agenda, we're going to go navigating through to your project, how to get there, how to open your scripts, how to import if you've got work from another um, source that you want to sort of bring into Celtics, um, all the different line types, how we kind of do formatting. Um, the auto formatting and keyboard shortcuts are going to be um, a way to sort of speed up your writing. Um, and I'll get to show off a nice little feature we released today. Um, then we're going to cover over a few strange cases or those unique ones. Um, some things that were uh, submitted uh, by all of you um, as early access questions. Um, and then how to set goals for yourself, the sort of final touches uh, of, for a script. And then we'll get into like how sharing and co-writing in real time works. A lot of stuff to cover. Then if we've got some time, more Q&A. All right. Um, and we have a, a Q&A uh, section here in the webinar. So if you ask your question in there, we'll hopefully be able to get to it. Um, if not, we'll follow up after. All right. So um, what's our first thing? Well, navigating your project. So I'm going to do a little bit of, uh, you know, slideshow here, but I'm going to actually use our product in real time here so we can kind of get a feel for what it looks like. So this is uh, what a Celtics account will look like if you got one solitary project and a really big monitor in my case. Um, things spread out a little bit. And uh, if you don't have a project yet, um, when you hit create, that's what you'll see. You'll be able to create a bunch of different ones, um, different project types, but we're gonna focus on film and TV here. And I'm gonna assume that most of you have at least a blank project in Celtics. If not, sign up for an account. We'll give you one. Um, and you can navigate to this project, say you've logged out, you log back in, you'll be dropped here, or um, you'll be able to navigate to your project either through this view or through your profile for your recent activity. We'll also show you what you've recently worked on. If you're working on multiple projects and you want to and you jump around a lot, this will say, oh, that's the one I was working on last. Um, and you'll also be able to get um, access to other documents. Um, quick note on a future topic, when you share with another person and they are working on a document, 
you will also see their activity here. So um, opening your project, wow, you just click on it. It's surprising for a web software um, that you, when you click on it, it opens. Uh, not really, but um, this would be the blank state. Um, one of the things a lot of people may notice because there's a nice little animation we put in here um, is all of these other uh, project files. So each Celtic project comes with a bunch of different files. We put you in the sort of script because we're primarily uh, known for our script writing uh, software, but um, we have a beat sheet, storyboard, uh, a catalog, cast and crew. So everything you need going all down through if you want to actually bring your script into production, which is one would hope the final, final goal or maybe selling the movie um, in the end. Uh, but you can start here in the script um, and clicking on any of these will jump you to another document within your project. So, um, wow, well, we've navigated to your project. That's, that's a whole section done and, done and dusted, uh, really easy. So our next section is about the line types and sort of keyboard shortcuts in Celtic. So Celtics is a very sort of on rails script editor. Um, what it will do is it will only provide you the, the line types that you need to make a script. Um, that includes act breaks, scene headings, action, character, transitions, etc. And all of that is available just by typing. Now, when you have a blank script, we kind of give you a little, uh, what we affectionately call ghost text. It gives you a little information on like, this is roughly how you format stuff. And, uh, You'll see that scene headings are always capitalized um, and then sometimes numbered, depends on if you're in production or not. We'll touch on that when we get later on. Um, then action, then there's character names, their dialogue, parentheticals, also known as Riley's. Um, scene headings are also sometimes called slug lines, um, which I think is just a gross word, so I'm not gonna use it. Uh, but all of those line types are available to you. Um, you can quickly see what one you're typing in as you type um, up here in this dropdown. And this will list all of them. And you can convert any line type by either tab, hitting tab to switch between the line types or any of these keyboard shortcuts. So if I'm writing, and one of the big things, you start your scene with a scene heading. Um, most scene headings are either interior or exterior, and there's a pretty set format for this in the industry. You can deviate a little bit, but um, it is usually um, all caps, and this will automatically be all caps for you. Um, we'll suggest to you uh, the correct format if you'd like, um, and then you put in the location or place name, and then a dash or a hyphen, a space, and then the time of day. Most, from my experience, uh, most sort of directors, assistant directors, really like it when you use just the basics. Um, and that's like day or night, or um, in the cases when you're doing things like a scene that takes place immediately after another scene, continue. Um, or later. Those things can work, but it's really, really helpful when you're doing up things like schedules and call sheets to use day and night. Um, those are the usual suspects. Um, hitting enter will automatically take you into action. Hooray. This is where you put your action, your description of what you do. Uh, what's happening in the scene usually starts with a description of your uh, the scene that you're in your location and any sort of main characters will come in uh, usually you don't want to write more than like four lines before you get to dialogue anything else unless you're having like some very very long scene of nobody talking um, but a lot of action um, you'd be surprised how many scripts um, where the action is literally just described as they fight. Um, they don't get like your big Marvel uh, movies where there's a giant fight scene or something like that. 
it's probably not going blow for blow. Um, if you just to answer the question that came in is if the scene is in morning or late evening, you could do that. Um, a lot of people will put in dawn and dusk. Um, but ultimately, my experience, um, assistant directors are going to ask you to change that to day or night. It's just for the consideration of the crew, it's almost always about like the lighting and when you're going to be filming. Um, if it's if it's dawn and that's super important to the scene, sure, put in dawn um, or dusk. You want to get that magic hour light. Um, okay, so simple things like action. You can uh, say talk about uh, a woman enters. Her name is, and then you would put their name in, but you want to always put those people's names in all caps. So we're just going to go with Anya because uh, your name's right in front of me, Anya. I apologize. Um, and then usually you'll put a little hyphen or brackets and then a description of that person. So if it's like uh, long hair, their age, um, if there's any sort of distinguishing features, I'm not going to do that to you, Anya, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but usually you would follow up with that, um, a description of the character. Once that's sort of done, uh, you hit enter again, you've got another line of action. If you want Anya to speak, you have to type her name, you tab to switch over to character, and then you can type in Anya's name. Uh, hitting enter will jump you to dialogue. You can see all that. Um, this is what she says. Um, if she says anything in a particular way. So for example, Anya says, hello. She's not impressed with me right now. Uh, so unimpressed um, is a parenthetical. Parentheticals usually describe how the actor would present this line. So if hello is pretty nondescript, but it could be like angrily. Um, and this is where the name Riley comes from. Uh, if they're being wry or silly or something like that. You can also use it within a sort of line to describe a bit more. Uh, let's type, we can cycle through all these. Uh -huh. um, you can describe a break in the action or a break in the dialogue. Say you wanted to um, have a pause and then how are you? You can do that. That is a really easy way to um, influence performance, but a really important rule um, that you should take on as, an, as a writer is not realize you're not the director. Um, do not direct from the page. Don't go through and try and give performance notes on every single line. Don't write in every single shot that you anticipate unless it's like crucial to the story. Um, so if you're getting down in the nitty gritty of how this person stands and hands on, you're, you're directing from the page. Don't, don't do that. Um, you're not going to make any friends with the director. Unless the director is like you and you're the writer, director, producer of your own little, do whatever you want then. If you're talking about commercial sale, probably try and avoid those things. Okay. Um, so a lot of this will work just by enter and tab. Um, if we're talking about other keyboard shortcuts, um, our system has a lot and we just implemented a quick reference guide um, in the help menu, uh, you'll see keyboard shortcuts and you can take a quick gander. Um, there's a big long list of all the things you can do um, in this system, just in the editor. And every module that I talked about um, over here in this menu um, has its own keyboard shortcuts. So check them out, learn more. Um, this learn more button will take, us, take you to our support center, which will have a full list of everything. And if it's not all there, you can blame our support person, Marcel, because he told me I could blame him uh, for that. Okay, so we've got a scene. We've got a second scene heading here. 
Exterior place, place. Uh, night. Okay. We've got a couple scenes. That's great. Um, next, we kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, like transitions is another thing you can do in here. Um, we've got a transition. This falls into like a little bit of a gray zone. You don't need to say cut to in every between every single scene unless that transition is like super important like um the uh wavy lines between the dream sequence like that that would be a okay one but cutting yeah your editor is going to cut uh the director is going to make choices about when uh and how transitions happen leave it to them for the most part, unless it's like super important, like they get hit in the head and it's cut to black. Um, usually you end with a colon, but you don't have to. Okay, so we've covered off. Let's see here. Um, we gotta type fast. Next, the weird cases. So we got a bunch of questions about some weird cases or not so weird, but like stuff that isn't immediately noticeable in the system. So I wanted to sort of stop the worry about how intercutting works. Um, so phone conversations, everybody worries about phone conversations, both on the phone and texting. So the big ones that you want to talk about are like, the easy way to accomplish this is just have someone holding a phone to their ear and talking. That's the, the simplest one. Um, but most people aren't really concerned about that. You get that. You can hear a voice on the phone. Um, you can write them as dialogue if they're on the phone but not shown, just as voiceover. Um, but most people are concerned about like, I'm in a car. The other person is uh, on a spaceship and we're calling each other and Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. How do I show that? There's a couple ways. Um, if we're cutting between kind of two locations, we call it intercutting, and both the parties are seen, it's like really two clean ways and one dirty way to do this. The, the messy way is totally acceptable. You literally put a scene heading in between every single one when you think you're going to cut back and forth. Um, messy, very messy, um, but it gets the job done. The other way to do it is um, they're talking back and forth. You can use just a single slug line, intercut, square bracket, location one, slash, square brackets, location two, and then just have them talking as if they were um, just like people in the scene. Um, you don't need to, you know, make a big, big deal about cutting back and forth. If it's just like two people sitting there talking on the phone, Make it one scene. Um, you can also, the more complicated way, if there's a lot of action shown, things happening, um, you want to establish each location. So just as an example, um, on the phone. Uh, now, uh, you would probably say continuous or um, at the same time, Andrew is on the phone with Anya, Andrew. And then you can just have the dialogue. What he says, what she says. Um, once you've kind of done that, you can, you can also put in like another slug line here if you really want to. I said I wouldn't call it a slug line, but I did. Uh, um, in which case you could go intercut. Place one and two. Um, they are on the phone. You can do that. Um, that's the simplest way. That'll get it, get it done. People will understand you. And if you're really worried about it, you can literally put in notes, like just go like, note, they're on the phone. 
cut when you think <laughs> it's important. Um, there. Um, now, that covers that one. What about texting? Texting is pretty much the same thing. You can just say uh, texting. Literally, as a as a a um, parenthetical, you can also put them in italics. Some people suggest doing that. Um, you just hit the I here uh, to make them italics. That's it. Um, those are the the big ones that a lot of people asked about. Like I think about four people sent a request asking about what that is. So. Um, that should do it. Um, now, setting some goals for yourself. Um, our system will let you set some little personal goals, a little motivational um, device, um, and you can set yourself a deadline. This is all like if you're a student, you probably have deadlines. If you uh, want to get into certain festivals or screenwriting competitions, you know what you need or when you need to get things done. You have a goals system in Celtics, a way to keep yourself honest. Um, you can either go up here under view and hit script goals, or you can see it down here with your little goal tracker. By default, we set everybody a little daily goal of 250 words, which is about one page, just so everybody's aware. If you click on this, you'll sort of see where you are. This will change colors, this will advance. I've got about 70 words out of 250. Um, once I hit 250 words, you get a little fireworks celebration, a little yay you. Um, if you want to sort of calculate what your progress is gonna need to be every day, you're not quite sure. You can go to our advanced section in the goals. You can put in a total word count so for example, a 90 minute script is 90 pages. That amounts to around 22,000 words, 20 to 22,000, depending on how dense you're being. Um, but if I said 22,000 words um, and then set myself a little goal, I can set a, a goal of getting it done by, let's say, the 11th of November. Um, it will say, my goal is now 1290 words every day between now and then. So I can just copy paste that in here and I can keep track of where I am today. This number, the 70 here, will reset every day. So if you didn't get yesterday's done, sorry, you needed to and you'll need to recalculate how much more you need to do. Um, so that's a really, really great way to sort of keep track of what you need to write and how fast to write. Um, okay. So that's sort of setting your goal, setting some deadlines for yourself. Um, next would be title pages, a little the finishing touches. So you got a lot of stuff written. Um, and now you want to prep for, you, congratulations, you're going to make your own script. Um, or someone has purchased it, and you're going to use Celtics to run your production. Um, let's take a quick gander at the things that you're probably going to want to turn on to start. Uh, the first thing is probably uh, scene numbers. Most sort of production scripts will have scene numbers, and our system will automatically number all your scenes. So if you add another scene, you're going to get scene four, scene five, etc. If you are in production, you're filming already, and you know that you've got to add a scene or omit a scene, you want to be using revision mode. So that is under the edit menu. You can switch to blue pages, yellow pages, goldenrod. You can go through the entire paper chase here. Um, if you need to while in production. But I'm not going to do that right now. Um, so that will lock your script and then your scene numberings will advance uh, with alpha. So it'll be like scene 2A, scene 2B, if you add scenes in between number 2 and 3. 
Okay, um, title pages. That's right here for now. We're working on uh, putting the title page right in the script, so it's a lot easier to see and access, but the title page, look at that. Um, you can use a couple different templates that we have. Um, if you want to give it a title, byline literally get a lot of questions about this. You, you can put just by. Um, you can also uh, say written by or adapted for the screen by, and then your name. So, uh, if you have a base on, if it's based on a book or another work, you can put it in there your copyright information and your contact information. Copywriting, you usually, um, we have some questions in advance about how to copyright your script. Um, the short answer is, it depends on what country you're in. <laughs> but uh, most places like the United States and Canada have rules where it's copywritten upon creation. So um, you own it, you made it, it's yours. You don't have to, a lot, a lot of sort of uh, industry myths around like, you have to send it to yourself by registered mail to get a date put, no, no, you don't need to do that. Um, you can register with the WGA uh, if you want. Uh, they have a section on their site to do that, um, but you should own the copyright in advance already because you wrote it. Um, that should answer that question. So going back to your main scripts, just take a quick gander. Have we covered rearranging scenes was the other thing I wanted to cover. Sorry. Navigation um, is the other way to rearrange scenes. So in uh, just a regular script, you can open this and you can literally click and drag to rearrange your scenes and reorder them. If you are locked and in production already, you can't. Um, you won't be able to do that. Uh, so make sure you've got everything in the right order before you lock your pages in revision mode. Um, but click and drag should uh, rearrange your scenes in the script. Um, and you can pin this open if you want to. You can also use this to jump. I'm only on one page right now, but uh, if this is a 90 page script, this grows really long and you can use this navigation to jump around in the script. Um, cool. So that covers navigation, scene headings, uh, turning on uh, numbers for your scenes. You can also turn on numbers uh, for dialogue. Some people really like putting in uh, dialogue lines and those appear at every line of dialogue for a person. So if a character says a single line, it'll always be numbered. It's pretty rare, but some people like to do it. Um, and then and you, can, you can turn them on and off right here. Okay. Uh, one other thing that people kind of had a quick question about um, in the script was a how to do people talking over one, each, one another or really fast dialogue. Um, that usually appears if two people are like arguing and talking at the same time, um, you'll usually see something called dual dialogue and that appears right here in our system. So if you hit that, uh, you'll have two characters right next to each other. So, uh, Andrew and then yelling about something. Uh, and then Anya is here and then yelling about the same thing, but it's different. <laughs> Uh, so I never said it was super creative on the spot, by the way. Uh, you can keep writing in this uh, sort of back and forth way, um, but you can always go back to regular dialogue. You can also take, if you've pre-written two lines of dialogue um, as regular dialogue, you can highlight that text and convert it to dual dialogue um, just by hitting the button. Um, these can also contain uh, parentheticals if you need them to. Um, angry. Uh, and those will run right alongside one another. Um, 
it was interesting I, in preparation for this, I also was looking up some information on how to do the weird case of like translations or subtitles. And one of the examples is, uh, I don't know if everybody's seen everything everywhere all at once, but they actually used du dual dialogue to put in the Chinese and the English um, for both the same character. So it would be like Evelyn and Evelyn right next to each other, English over here, or sorry, Chinese on the left, English on the right. Um, and then they have a note saying how to read this. So it's like, this is spoken in Chinese, what's on the left, but the subtitles are on the right. And sometimes they'll speak, they'll be speaking in Chinese, but say a few English words in the same line. And then those will be bolded in the English side. So that's a, you can look up the uh, script for almost any of these like big pictures online, just Google them. Um, you'll find them and it, and I highly recommend reading a lot of scripts like this because um, they'll give you ideas and how to sort of be more inventive with your action. That's a very inventive action movie. Uh, or even just how to structure the script in an interesting way. So just Googling like scripts, PDF, and you'll find the PDF of the script that was used in production sometimes. Um, Sometimes they'll even have little notes on it, highlighter marks. It's really great. Okay. Um, so that's the, the sort of basics of how to use it by yourself, how to get it into uh, production. Co-writing and sharing in our system is really, really simple. Um, I just wanna show you how to share. Can you guess where it is? It's the big purple share button. You can put a, a name or an email uh, in here. If you've saved the person previously, like if you've shared a previous project with them, that it'll autofill for you. Um, you can give them access to just your script, to read all the documents in your project. And if you want to, you can get even more granular with permissions in our collaborator space. So right here, once you've shared with someone, you can get, you can turn on and off uh, the various project files to, you know, maybe you don't want the other co-writer to see the budget where they're not getting paid as much as you. Um, that's a little pro tip right there. Um, you can turn that off in collaborators right here. Um, now, uh, when you're writing with friends, you can actually see them writing at the same time. So once you've shared with a writing partner, you can see their cursor on the screen. Um, in the top right of the uh, editor, you'll see their avatar, which will usually be their initials. Um, and if you click on that avatar, it'll jump to where they are in the script. You can also uh, see what parts of the text they're highlighting, um, and you can work together in real time. So that's a really um, great feature. And that comes basic in Celtics. Um, so anytime you want to join a little writer's room, it can support a dozen people writing at the same time. It is going to get really confusing. Things will jump around, but that's the nature of the business um, working together. OK. Um, oh, we're at Q&A. I'm going to cover off a few firsts uh, that were submitted in advance. Um, and then we're going to try to get to some of the ones that are there in the live chat. Um, so first of all, someone asked, how do I make a plot line using Blake Snyder's Save the Cat? Which I love that you brought up this book because I love this book. Uh, I don't have my copy of it because I lent it to somebody, uh, but this is, I love this book, it's fantastic. Um, so the easiest way to sort of make a plot line in uh, Celtics is within your project, check out using the beat sheet system. Uh, Blake Snyder is all about the major beats um, and our beat sheet comes with um, a three act sort of structure built in, but you can add as many beats as you want. Um, we give them weird little names, but you can structure it however you want. It's very uh, versatile. You just put in you know, the opening image is the first thing that appears. Um, and then you can write it in. Um, this is a description field. Um, and you can have a bunch of 
text. Um, I'm not going to put that in. Uh, and then once you've kind of created, you can color code. Um, we've just put in a bunch of new color systems here. Um, so you can color code however you want. Um, but then once you've sort of selected one of these guys um, or multiples, you can export the beads to the script and they will automatically fill in your blank script or append to the bottom of any written text in your script. So if I export this, the setup, um, it should add to my script um, real quick. There it is. So you can prep your entire outline in the beat sheet. Um, all of the save the cat format, fill in the details um, as sort of bullet points and then push it into the script and it will start filling things in. Um, so that's a really quick way to um, outline. Outlining is a really great tool. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, so you can just, for each of these, have a little beat in there, uh, fill it in with the details of what you want. You can start breaking things down even more granularly and then just select the beats that you want to uh, send to the script. You can hold shift and click on the beats in the order you want them to go to the script in and then hit export to script and it will push the data in. It copies it in so it doesn't remove it from your beat sheet. So you always have a record of that. Um, so another question was uh, a lot about um, how do I write good action? How do I write um, sort of meaningful character arcs for people? Uh, this is called, this is from helping writers become authors, but um, a lot of uh, people structure using Save the Cat. This one is a little different. This one focuses on the, the concept of the lie, the truth, wants, and needs. So um, at the beginning, pretty much every story arc is starts with a character believing a lie, either about themselves or about the world. And their arc throughout the various acts will be the discovery of what the actual truth is, what they actually need, um, and then you know how to reject the lie and embrace the truth about the world and then get some real resolution. That's how you kind of tie your character to the plot arc. Um, the truth is liberating. So that's detailed really well in another book I'm gonna kind of mention in a little bit right now. Uh, K.M. Whelan's Creating Character Arcs is such a useful resource. I have my own copy right here. Um, someone was asking how much time I should spend on secondary character arcs, and I wanted to do a little bit of a dive on that, uh, but that is literally a chapter in this book. Uh, it's chapter 24. Um, should all my character, minor characters have arcs? Uh, and it goes into what that means. So it kind of depends on the stories you're telling, like I point out here, doing a one woman play versus um, a generational epic. Um, something like Cloud Atlas, you're gonna you're gonna have minor characters that you're probably gonna wanna, gonna wanna give arcs to, but maybe not. Um, it really depends on the scale of your story. Um, but character arcs are the story is the really important thing to take away. It's not that like the plot happens to this person and they are just a bystander. That's a really boring story, and I've written that story and I hated it. So. Don't, don't make my mistake. Um, the character's arc is intrinsically tied to the plot. It is how, the plot is what helps them discover the lie about themselves and the truth about the world. Um, minor characters, the point of those are really about like reinforcing the main character's uh, stuff and theme. So I did a little deep dive on a movie that uh, is very fun. Uh, some people love it, some people hate it, I don't, I don't know why. But it's The Rock by Michael Bay. Great movie. Um, very great for demonstrating this, actually. Um, the theme, duty, theme is almost always directly stated uh, in the script, um, often by a secondary character. Um, so they often, secondary characters or minor characters will sometimes literally say, this movie is about... <laughs> 
in this case, duty. Um, so Stanley Goodspeed um, literally says at the beginning, I don't believe in anything anymore. The world has gone to crap. It's not worth saving. Like he doesn't believe that he has an effect on the world. Everything is terrible. Even after his save the cat moment in uh, defusing a bomb, uh, he doesn't, he's just stressed out by it. He doesn't believe that it's worth saving. Um, or as he puts it, not worth bringing a child into. Uh, so he doesn't want that. And he wants to stay at home with his wife. So, and the villain, Hummel, believes in duty completely. Like his main motivation is duty. Um, he takes it too far. And the, your, your, um, your antagonist is almost always the sort of dark reflection of the main character. Um, what if they l believed the lie or what if they believed the truth, but in the wrong way um, and took it to the most extreme thing. He's really believes that soldiers who did their duty are literally worth killing United States citizens for. That's what he says, though he's bluffing. Um, Mason, Sean Connery, he's jaded. He doesn't believe in it anymore. He had duty and he lost it. Um, and he, ha he and Cage kind of rediscover what that means over the course of the story and are literally about like self-sacrifice at the end. He die. he like takes on all these mercenaries who again, the SEAL team members are minor characters, but they have a really small arc, which is like, I believe a thing. I'm going to go do the thing. I died for it. That's a, that's kind of a character arc. Um, but each of them kind of reinforcing either total belief in the theme or in total adherence to the theme or the antithesis of the theme. Um, so that's kind of where you would put minor character arcs in there and sort of your secondary antagonist and B plot characters as well. Um, I didn't mention the FBI directors who also are sort of a corruption of duty, which is an interesting, it's a, it's a deeper movie script than you really realize. It's kind of cool. Um, again, read movie scripts because they'll teach you all this sort of structure stuff, but also like really how to build tension between character arcs and the plot. Um, is that the end? No, I probably have more questions. Um, so Anya, do you have access to that? And I'll, I'll stop this. If you want though, before I close out this uh, screen share, go to our blog. There's lots of really great articles about all of this stuff there. And if you've got questions, our support team is always around to help. I'm gonna stop sh sharing for a moment and uh, yeah. Great, awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was super insightful. Um, on the topic of characters, one of our actually latest questions from an anonymous attendee is, should I make it known who are major and minor characters? I think the plot is definitely gonna just reveal that, but you don't need to like state it so much as like, again, in uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, the scene where Joy is introduced, um, not Joe Butapaki, but Joy, the child. Um, she gets a little blurb after her name, uh, explaining who she is, how she behaves, etc. And then her girlfriend shows up and it's just says her girlfriend. So that's pretty clear that that's a minor character. Um, if you give them lots of description and lots of attention, they're a major character. Um, if you don't, then they aren't. Um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> and actually, great segue. On that note, another question asks, how in-depth for character descriptions, appearance, clothing do you need to go? Uh, that really depends on if it's important to the character, like if it's revealing about them. So the description, like if hair color comes up, include it. Um, if it's, uh, if you're trying to get across that this is like a haggard detective in a boiled, hard boiled suit, 
tie. It's the dark and stormy night kind of stuff. Uh, you might want to go into that. Like he's got a five o'clock shadow and bags under his eyes and he's got a hip flask and a trench coat that looks like this. If you're, if it's really important to how you're telling the story, if it's just like slice of life, somebody's living their life and you don't really want to get into that the important details of he has red shoes on doesn't come into the plot. You don't really need to include it. Um, but a little bit of description to spark people's imagination is always good. Awesome. Pivoting away from characters for a minute, we had a couple of questions around music. So specifically do's and don'ts around including music cues, but then also how specific can you get? For example, if you have specific lyrics that you want to include in a particular scene. Right. So the musical. That's the, I should have thought of that one beforehand and had a good example. Um, a lot of musicals, um, it it depends. Are you writing a full musical? Then their lines are the sung lyrics. Um, if you are just like, um, this song plays, you can literally put it in the action, um, highlight the text, put it in italics. Someone's going to tell you that you don't have the rights for it and you're going to have to change it. So don't get too into it. Um, be willing to kill that darling real quick because uh, those sorts of rights are complicated. Um, but if you, if it's like integral to the story, I'm thinking like Battlestar Galactica, they talked a lot about um, uh, all along the watchtower. Um, they must've gotten that, the rights to that song uh, beforehand. And likewise, that song's also used in the Watchmen. Uh, so it seems like that one's an easy one to get the rights to. So maybe just use all along the watchtower. Awesome. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe use whatever song you want, but just type it in the action. Uh. Cool. All right. A few more questions. We'll try to get through all of them, but they're coming in fairly quickly. Um, now, the big overarching question, and really the elephant in the room, is, so I've written my script. Now what? How do I get it to an agent? How do I transform it from just a piece of paper on my computer into a real thing? Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, not super uh, successful in that personally, uh, <laughs> but uh, you would, um, there's a few avenues you could try to get an agent, literally cold calling, like hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, that's hard. Um, and it's, Given how um, democratized the industry is now for writing, like we all have access to Celtics for free if you want to write. Um, you can submit your, you can get a PDF, you can print it off, Bob's your uncle. Um, you can mail it off and it will probably end up in a box, um, which is the whole reason that like something like the blacklist was created. Um, if you haven't looked them up, really good thing. But now it's so popular that they're inundated with so many scripts. Um, one tactic that I've heard is literally going to like festivals and uh, other sort of events, conventions that have pitch sessions. So um, for example, there's a local festival in my town where a lot of Canadian producers come to screen their films and then the festival will get them uh, to have a big room, a pitch room, where they just literally sit at tables and you get a five minute window, you your elevator pitch. So uh, you've got, got to write your log line, you've got to do all the, the character development in advance. You usually don't even need to have the full script done in a lot of these cases, but it helps, um, or at least a draft. Don't get so like into your own idea that you're not willing to change things. You're not willing to adapt on the fly, but yeah, there's a, it's a hard world to get into, to break into. And I never did it. So <laughs> if you find out, I do also want to mention, and a colleague of mine actually pointed this out to me because um, I'm not a published writer either. Um, but stage 32, if you go to mm. stage32.com, that is sort of kind of the, the LinkedIn for anyone in the industry. So you can start um, really getting to know other people in the industry. 
like anything else, it's all about networking. So just putting yourself out there as much as possible, really. Yeah. And some people keep their IMDb profiles updated. I don't. Mine doesn't have anything other than a few short films on it. Um, but keep their IMDb profiles updated. And some even have contacts. Like IMDb Pro, I think, also allows you to contact people. Um, but definitely hit or miss on that one. All right. Hopefully that answered some folks' questions. Um, all right. We have a few more minutes and a few more questions. Still good to go, Andrew? Yeah. I see one, uh, how to download the script, someone was asking. Um, under file, uh, print, you can print the script. It will also have a download option in there, um, download the PDF. So under file in the script, you can also share it to the people directly um, using a um, shareable link um, in our system, which is under file, create link. Um, that will give them a always up to date version of the script. So it's a public link, like with any other document where if you just posted it on Twitter, anyone could click on it and read your script. It will, it will be the most up to date version. So if you make changes, they'll be in there. Um, they can't see real time you writing and they can't see any of the documentation that goes with it. But um, yeah, uh, those are some options there. Awesome. Now we had this one question uh, live in the Q&A as well as pre-submitted before the webinar. Um, any advice for writing punchy action descriptions? Yeah, um, read lots of scripts. Um, Stephen King, I think, wrote in on writing that if you're not reading a lot, what are you doing? Like a writer's job is to write um, and read. So go through, like I was saying, there's a couple of websites out there that host like the winning screenplays from the Oscars in PDF format. Read through them and see what they do. You know, I'll quote someone else. It's probably Picasso, but uh, what? Well, how does it go? It's uh, ah, someone will know. Uh, it's the uh, copying people is. Uh, the greatest form of flattery, is it? Um, <laughs> bad paraphrasing on my part. I shouldn't have said that. Oh. <laughs> Imitation. Imitation is the finest form of flattery, probably. I don't know. Um, obviously, I should have wrote that down. Maybe it was Banksy that wrote it, though. No, it wasn't. No? No. It's People who know that. Yeah, <laughs> it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, but yeah, copy things. Copy their style if you want. If you love a particular movie, see what they did um, and what they got people to read and buy. Like they literally, these are success stories. So feel free to copy everything about them. Um, maybe not the entire text. Yeah, plagiarism does exist. Don't, don't do that. And uh, don't use AI. No. <laughs> Be a little more creative. <laughs> um. All right, we have a few more minutes. Um, and to Kieran there, yes, we can absolutely share the slides after our webinar. We will send out a recording of this as well as a slide deck so you can hold on to it um, for your own use. But um, there were a couple of other really good questions here. Now, we received this live as well as pre-submitted, and that is how do you determine what qualifies as a special? Not sure if we can answer that. Uh, like a... I'm not sure what you mean by a special, like, is in like a funding, like a TV special, like a mini series kind of thing, or like a. I think more like a, along the lines of a mini series. Is it just limited to budget and or shooting constraints? Do we get to decide yeah. that as writers, or is that decided down the pipeline? No, probably not. Uh, you probably don't get to decide. Uh, it's when it's produced, the producer is probably going to make the decisions on how it's produced. Um, yeah. So if it is a TV special, like a one-off, like Christmas special movie that's coming on made for TV stuff, that's what it'll be. Um, congratulations, you got it made. Uh, it's really great. Um, if it's, if you get picked up for a 10 part Netflix series, uh, limber up your wrists and fingers, cause it's gonna be a lot of typing. Uh, but 
problems of success. <laughs> yeah. Uh, newest question. What are some of the best competitions to submit to? Honestly, I think mm. this is very, very regionally based. So wherever you're based, honestly, Google, see if there are writing competitions, see if there are any festivals that you can submit your work to in your immediate area. But Andrew, I think you have a little bit more experience than I do with that. Yeah, not not a whole lot more. Um, but you can submit. Most of them will let you submit even if it's not in your region. But um you can check out reviews for a lot of these uh, competitions and festivals. Some are literally, if they have like a high cost entry, uh, buyer beware, uh, check them out. Like look for reviews of these. Some are just like, I'm not saying that like they're scams, but I'm saying that like you can fall prey to sort of predatory um, costs. Um, so avoid those if you can, but, uh, go to, yeah, go to Google and just start searching for ones, well-known ones. I don't know if you want to go to like con or something like that or Sundance or South by Southwest, but, um, couldn't hurt. And then again, reading about the history of a film, like how it got made. Um, there are sort of success stories out there that you can kind of try to emulate, um, or, like look into where was this, how did these people break into the industry? Well, in the case of the Daniels who wrote everything everywhere all at once, they made music videos first. Um, so you can just cut your teeth on creating interesting visuals. I think they did Turn Down for What um, by Little John. Uh, was it Little John? Yeah, maybe. Um, but Turn Down for What is them and they made that. And then they've caught attention of all the people out there saying, this is really visually interesting. And then one of the actors who appears in that music video appears in their film. Um, they, they like to work with the same people. They can build a following like that. Other people, the, there was a horror movie that came out really recently, which was a bunch of two YouTubers um, who, uh, yeah, they just pitched it. See where they pitched it who they pitched to, who their producer is, and then check the lineups for a lot of festivals and sort of conferences to see who's there. Don't go into like Disney with a horror movie. Don't try and pitch, you know, Pixar, uh, something that's not an animated film, obviously, but find people who have produced the films that you enjoy and see where they're going, um, see where they're presenting and try and get there. <laughs> Try and get in front of them too. Face to face often works a lot better than email. We have a couple of folks from the Celtics teams here uh, joining us, and someone just messaged me letting me know that also a good resource is filmfreeway.com. Mm, um, and yeah. you're looking to uh, submit your script. So check that out, everyone. Again, that's filmfreeway.com. Yeah, and Film Freeway is also used for submitting to festivals for finished films as well. So that'll help you um yeah yeah um all right we are at time for anyone's questions that we did not get to we will send out a follow-up email just highlighting some of our answers and recommendations thank you everyone so so much for joining we are really excited to have you here we're really excited to be able to uh have this chat and looking forward to future webinars stay tuned thank you andrew cheers bye bye bye